Excuse me. Well, <clears throat> this morning <clears throat> we're going to finish the last three verses of Luke chapter 20. And as I've already told you, it is a warning against the, uh, the scribes and against, I believe, uh, the, certainly the teaching, but also the example of the scribes, that they don't get led astray. Remembering that Jesus on other occasions warned his disciples against the influences of the spiritual leaders of Israel, um, that they should listen early to what they, they say because they sit in the seat of Moses, but they should not follow their example because they don't do actually what they're saying. So this is what we read in Luke 20, verses 45 through 47. And while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. And by the way, in, in Matthew's gospel, as he's uh, following the same events after the triumphal entry, uh, this is where Jesus launches into those woes to the scribes and the Pharisees, hypocrites, okay? So what we're looking at here is really a warning again uh, to the disciples and to the crowds against the, uh, the influence of these men. So let's... Um, let's well, pray that God would uh, help us to think about how this might apply today. Now, just again, catching up from where we, we were, we saw that Jesus, uh, having already answered the questions of the religious leaders, and having asked one of his own that they weren't able to answer, that, that his enemies withdrew because they didn't want to give Jesus any more opportunities to make them look foolish uh, in the eyes of the people uh, to make them look bad and to make Jesus look good. And so they basically withdrew. And after they withdrew, Jesus now turns to his disciples and to the crowds who were listening to warn them against the influences of these men. He says in verse 46, beware of the scribes. And you know the word beware means essentially watch out for them, be on your guard against them. I've already told you in Matthew 23, Jesus also includes the Pharisees since they were guilty of the same sins. And I don't know if we, if we understand sometimes the relationship between the scribes and the Pharisees. We, we know there is some overlap. Some of the scribes were actually uh, Pharisees. So what is it that Jesus is warning uh, his disciples and the crowds uh, against or uh, about these men? Well, what he's saying is if they were not careful that they might be taken in by their deception, their pretense to spirituality, and begin to, to imitate them. Uh, our Lord had earlier warned His disciples against the, the leaven of the Pharisees for the same reason. Remember, it was in the context of having fed the 5,000, and the disciples thought He was speaking about bread because they didn't bring bread. But no, beware of the teaching of the Pharisees. Beware of the example of the Pharisees. I, I think that uh, we might perhaps depreciate and underestimate the example that these uh, men might have had on, on the, even the disciples, but certainly among uh, the crowds. Adam Clark, who um, perhaps you're familiar with his um, commentary, it's actually a very good commentary, uh, was a British Methodist theologian of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And he, he writes this in this context. He says, a bad example, supported by the authority, reputation, and majesty of religion, which is what the scribes and the Pharisees were all about. He says, that bad example is a very subtle poison from which it is very difficult for men to preserve themselves. It is a great misfortune for any people to be obliged to beware of those very persons who ought to be their rule and pattern. So again, beware of these men who are the spiritual leaders because of the subtle poison. Now, this is good counsel, especially because the problem that Jesus was describing to them is a problem that still exists today. 
Again, think about the many people who were claiming to be godly, who were claiming to be modern-day prophets, um, and there are plenty. Uh, as a matter of fact, years ago, I was in the church of, of such an individual. And the sad thing is there are also many professing believers who may be very well-meaning who tend to follow these people because of their energy, because of their charisma, because they seem to be being used by God. And if they're being used by God, then God certainly must have sent Him. Uh, so many people following Him, that sort of uh, lends uh, credence to their ministry. But of course, the problem here is that people tend to, con to confuse popularity with godliness. You know, this is actually a logical Pharisee, a lot of people, uh, a fallacy, excuse me, well, a lot of people believe it. It must be true. A lot of people are following them. They must be from God, but that isn't necessarily the case. The only way we can know is by reading the Bible to see what the marks of godliness actually are. You know, Jesus', Jesus own example reminds us that uh, doing the right thing, living by God's law, uh, speaking the truth, isn't necessarily going to make us popular. The people that were popular were the ones that were doing the wrong thing, the ones that were speaking lies. Uh, speaking the truth is far more likely to make us unpopular. I mean, again, look at Jesus. He was absolutely perfect in every way, did everything absolutely right, spoke nothing but the absolute truth, and yet he was hated by his own people. And Jesus said to his own disciples in John 15, 19, that if you if you do the same, you're also going to be hated. He says, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you because you've identified with Christ. Identify with me, Jesus says, because you're following me, because you're, you're trying to be like me, you know, again, by the grace of God. Jesus tells us that if we live like him, we will be hated like him. He told his disciples in Matthew 10, 25, before he sent them out, if they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, or the devil, how much more will they malign the members of his household? If you follow Jesus, you do the right thing, you're going to be hated. Now, our goal, of course, as Christians is not to make people like us. Uh, sometimes um, I, we tend, you know, perhaps as we look at the spiritual leaders and the ministry today, sometimes we might get the impression that that's actually what it's all about. But that is not the goal. The goal is to point people to Jesus in the hope that Jesus will save them. But for, for us to do that, we have to live as He lived, and we have to speak as He spoke. In other words, we need to be humble, and we need to be genuine. We need to be not like the scribes and the Pharisees. We need to be like Jesus. So that's what we want to think about this morning from our passage. The first thing we want to look at is what, what godliness is and, of course, what it isn't. And then secondly, what's at the end of both of these paths that can motivate us to take one path rather than the other? Well, first of all, let's consider what godliness is and what it isn't. Now, we're all familiar with the Pharisees, I think, but sometimes we, we might tend to ask the question, who are the scribes? Because we really don't talk about them quite as much, even though Jesus very often groups them both together. Well, scribes are what you think they might be. Scribes are those that write, okay? Now, originally, they were the secretaries of state. They were those who were skilled writers who came mainly from the tribe of Levi, who were used by the king to prepare and issue decrees. Now, apparently, they also did this on occasion for the prophets. Uh, Jeremiah, we know, speaks quite a bit about uh, Baruch and uh, how Baruch wrote and delivered and read his prophecies to the officials of Judah and to the people. After the return from captivity, when the nation had uh, lost its freedom, since there were no longer any kings to serve, the scribes turned their attention to copying the Torah or copying the law. That's why we have, again, so many of these manuscripts. They were trying to keep them alive. Copies would wear out. New copies were, were needed. 
And so spending so much time uh, copying the law of God, they became the experts in the law. And that's why the scribes were also called the lawyers and why they became also the teachers of Israel. And you know, one of the things that uh, you find out whenever you become proficient in something, you become very sensitive about, uh, you know, what it is you're teaching and about what others might have to say on the same subject. Um, you become sensitive to other teachers and to, uh, again, what other people are saying. And so their sensitivity to the law of God is one of the things that often brought them into conflict with Jesus because they were teaching one thing, Jesus was teaching something else. But wait a minute, I'm an expert, and what you're saying is wrong. And so they were often challenging Jesus. But as we've seen, their challenges were not left unanswered. And Jesus would prove his point to them. Now, we need to understand that not all of the scribes necessarily opposed Jesus. There were two very high-profile scribes that really didn't but, but appeared uh, open to what he had to say. One of them was Nicodemus, who was the teacher of Israel. And the other was Gamaliel, who, remember, was um, cautioning the, the rest of the, uh, the, the Sanhedrin, essentially, not to persecute uh, you know, the, the, the apostles because they may find themselves fighting against God. But most of the scribes were opposed to them. Well, Jesus describes them in verses 46 through 47, and he tells us this is what we need to be on our guard against. He says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. Now, I think as you look at this list, the first thing that you might find striking is uh, that what Jesus is describing here, most of what he's describing, is simply spiritual pride, okay? These are the fruits of pride. They wanted the people of Israel to look up to them, to see them as knowledgeable, to see them as spiritual, to see them as pious men. Uh, those they could look to for spiritual guidance. I mean, this is essentially a pride trip for them. Now, that's the reason why they were wearing these long robes. According to the law of God, the, the robes were really supposed to go only to their, their heels, okay? Not too long and obviously not, not too short. But, but what these men did was they, contrary to the law of God, lengthened the fringes of their garment to the point where they literally were dragging behind them like the train of a wedding dress. Of course, in a wedding, there would be nothing wrong with that, but uh, for these men to have such a train behind them was, was only that people might notice them, that they'd be able to be singled out in a crowd. Uh, these men also loved respectful greetings, as Jesus said to the Pharisees to be called rabbi or father or leader. And again, terms of honor, even terms of endearment, showing some kind of dependence on them for their spiritual well-being. They love to be called that. They love to be recognized as such. They also love the, to be honored in the synagogues, the places of honor. Uh, the, the seats that they loved were those that were at the very front. And this is, again, a little bit different, although you know, in some churches, I've seen something perhaps similar to it where you have people sitting on stage, you know, who are looking out this way. But, but what happened in the synagogue was that there was a line of seats in the front next to where the law was being read. And the scribes loved to sit in those seats so they could face the people, so the people, they could see the people looking at them, sitting in these seats of honor and to think that they were something special. They also love these seats of honors at banquets. Remember when Jesus earlier warned his disciples against taking the highest seats at uh, places to, to which they'd been invited, such as wedding feasts? He was referring to these men because they loved to do this. All they could really think about was themselves, their own honor, their own glory. They weren't thinking about honoring other people. They weren't thinking about honoring the Lord. They were thinking about what most people think about today. In our culture, they love attention. They want to be singled out, to be special in one area or another. 
Now, uh, again, it's not always wrong to do that. It is if you're seeking it, but it's not wrong if people see those things and acknowledge those things and, and perhaps give thanks to God for those things. But these men were all about this. They wanted glory. They wanted honor. They were very prideful. But they were also hypocrites. While they were putting on this show of piety, they were also doing the one thing that I think God singles out uh, among all the different crimes that one person might commit, he particularly hated this one, and that was oppressing the widow, oppressing the orphan and the widow, but taking advantage of the helpless. They devoured widows' houses, and what he means by it is they took every legal opportunity that they could to take advantage of these poor women, to take away everything they had left to them, everything that they had to sustain them, and while they were doing this, again, claiming to be spiritual and righteous men, they were offering long prayers publicly so that, again, others might think well of them, might think that they were spiritual and righteous. Now, this is what Jesus was telling the disciples and the crowds that they were to watch out for, that they not so admire these men and their office that they begin to follow their example. Again, we need to understand that bad examples, even if we recognize them as bad, if we look at them long enough, can still influence us. We need to be on our guard against them, um, especially asking the question, as we do of some who have such huge followings, how can what they're doing be so bad if so many people are actually following what they're doing? But again, we have to use the scriptures to tell us whether it's right or wrong. We need like someone like Jesus, right? We need a reality check, uh, the one like Jesus gave to his disciples so that we don't become enamored with them. Now, the problem is we don't have Jesus with us today. So how do we avoid this? How do we avoid being influenced by them? How do we avoid the, the hypocrisy and the, the pridefulness of, of these men? How do we avoid having this veneer of Christianity, this outward appearance of godliness, but really uh, denying its power, really being no different from the world? Well, thankfully, the Lord has given to us uh, something that, that takes His place, not just something, well, we, something and someone. He's given us His Holy Spirit, but He's also given to us His Word. And what He has given to us in His Word to be able to tell the difference between what is good and bad is the law of God. We need to do what James tells us in James 1.25, fix our eyes on the perfect law of liberty because it is there that we learn what true godliness is. And certainly we need to see the, the Scriptures and everything our Lord calls us to do is simply an extension or an application when it comes to commandments, when it comes to ethics, when it comes to morality. It is simply an extension of the Ten Commandments. So what, what can we learn from the law of God about what we should be as opposed to what we see in these scribes? For instance, what does God think about pride? Well, Peter tells us God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. God prizes humility, not arrogance, not grandstanding, not people trying to draw attention to themselves, but He loves those who become invisible, who serve others. So what does the Lord think about respectful titles? Well, Jesus said to his disciples when he was contrasting again what the scribes and Pharisees were doing, pronouncing his woes upon them, he says, but, not do, but do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, and that is Christ. What does he think about uh, our trying to get brothers and sisters or, uh, well, to honor us like the people, uh, the scribes of the peoples of Israel? Uh, Paul tells us rather than trying to gain honor for ourselves from one another, he says that we are to honor each other. Uh, he writes in Romans 12.10, this clause, give preference to one another in honor 
which literally he's telling us that there is one area in the Christian life in which we are not only authorized but commanded to try to outdo each other. And that is in giving preference to one another or in showing honor to each other. So rather than trying to get honor for ourselves from one another, we should instead try to honor others, to try to build them up and make them look better than we are rather than uh, really building ourselves up at their expense. What about going for the best seats at public gatherings? Well, it wasn't that long ago we read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 8 through 11, what Jesus said about that to His disciples. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, or really any event, do not take the place of honor for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by Him. And He who invited you both will come and say to you, give place to this man. And then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, we do understand in today's context that if it, there really aren't places of honor so much, I would just suggest to you that if you're invited to a wedding, that you don't sit where the wedding, you know, the bride, the bride and groom and the wedding party are sitting. And there probably aren't going to be people who are going to be moving you around too much, but I think you see the principle here, don't seek for attention. Don't try to get people to look at you. Instead, we really need to get them to look at Jesus. The Lord wants us to be humble. And we also, we know how much the Lord hates <clears throat> hypocrisy. Again, go to Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Uh, the idea is, of course, putting on an act, an act of holiness, when in fact you're really living a life that is sinful. What does the Lord think about taking advantage of widows? Well, obviously, He doesn't want us to take advantage of the helpless. He wants us to help them. As a matter of fact, James tells us that, that pure and undefiled religion, that which is true piety, in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You know, sometimes we reduce Christianity to learning more facts, right? Uh, reading more theology, learning more of the secrets of God's counsel and, and will and how all these things fit together. Sometimes we think it, it's made primarily of going to church, making sure we're faithful in church and, uh, or in just keeping the commandments. But we do need to understand that um, God wants us to come in contact with other people and help people who are in difficulty. And so as we become aware of these people, whether they be orphans or widows, and in those days the most destitute, the most helpless people, we need to do what we can to try to help them, not take advantage of them. And obviously, our Lord doesn't want us to pray so that everybody can see us. He's not telling us that we can't meet for public prayer gatherings and it's wrong to pray in groups, but He is telling us it's always wrong to pray in order for other people to see you and to think that somehow you're special because you pray such, you pray such wonderful prayers, you know, use such eloquent language. And you're willing to do it in public places. The Lord wants us to pray in private where only He can see us. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6, Matthew, verses 5 and 6, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Don't make a pretense of godliness. Remember how Jesus said that the scribes and the Pharisees were like whitewashed sepulchers. Outwardly you appear beautiful to men, but inside you're full of corruption. Jesus tells us the inside needs to be cleaned out. We need to be born again by the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we do, as we are, 
then we will become what it is He calls us to become. We will follow the, the, the law of God from the heart. So Jesus tells us here that we need to be on our guard against the influences of those who are outwardly godly, but who inwardly are nothing more than hypocrites so that their hypocrisy and their pride doesn't find its way into our hearts. On the other hand, we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ who was absolutely pure within, absolutely spotless uh, outwardly, and, and make no room for the flesh in our lives. Remember, that was the famous passage that the Lord used to, con to convert Augustine. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for your flesh with regard to its lusts. That's what Jesus is telling us. Don't look at the bad example. Keep your eyes focused on the good example. Now, secondly, we should be careful to do this because we need to remember what's at the end of each of these paths, the end of hypocrisy and pride, at the end of godliness. Jesus tells us that what's at the end of this, what the scribes are doing in verse 47 is greater condemnation. Now, again, I want you to notice he doesn't say just condemnation, not just judgment and destruction and hell. But he says greater condemnation, greater than others, a greater degree of punishment in hell. Now, Jesus said essentially the same thing on another occasion where he was reproving uh, those that weren't listening to him, right? In Matthew 11, verses 21 through 24, he says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now listen, Tyre and Sidon were both very wicked cities. Tyre was basically singled out as so evil that the Lord ordained that the entire city would be torn down and even scraped off the land and cast into the sea. And we do know that when Alexander the Great uh, laid siege to the city, that the people secretly, uh, they, uh, they secretly left the city and, and they went out to a fortress that they had on an island just off the coast. And so when Alexander the Great finally broke into the city and he saw that they had escaped and gone to that island, he had the city torn down, cast into the ocean to build a causeway out to the island and he still conquered them, but the word of the Lord is fulfilled. Tyre was completely destroyed. Um, the citizens of Sodom, I don't think I have to say very much about them, were so evil that they wanted to violate, the men of the city wanted to violate the, the two men, or at least the two angels they thought were men, that had come in to rescue Lot. So we're talking about very wicked examples Jesus is bringing up. But he said it would be worse for Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum in the day of judgment than for those cities. And the question is, why? And it's because, Jesus said, he did miracles there. He did miracles that proved that, that the word he was speaking was actually the word of God. But they still would not listen. The more one's, or I should say the greater one's privileges, the more will be required of them. The scribes were obviously very privileged men. They, they were able to spend so much time in the Scriptures that they had become experts in the law. But because they had rejected what they had been given by God, their condemnation, Jesus says, ultimately would be greater. Now, Jesus is telling us that there are degrees of punishment, and it's based upon, you know, what levels of privilege the Lord has given to us. And if we reject what it is that He has given to us, we will become even guiltier than those who never had the Word of God 
even though they committed worse crimes, at least worse in a certain sense. I mean, really, if, if the men of Sodom had the Word of God, as well as those in Capernaum, I think Sodom would actually have been judged more guilty. The, the, the mitigating circumstances were that they were in darkness while Capernaum was in the light. So that tells us that we do need to make sure that we are taking hold of what it is the Lord has given to us, the privileges He's given to us, the gospel that He's given to us, the Word of God that He has given to us, that we need to make sure we are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, listening to His Word, turning from our sins, and following after Him. If, if we're doing that, then the privileges that He has given to us are actually working to our advantage. If we're doing this, then obviously these warnings against these cities these things will not happen to us. But the other thing we need to bear in mind is, is this, that um, even as there are degrees of punishment in hell, there are also degrees of reward in, in heaven. Um, that if the Lord has entrusted His word to us and we have entrusted, we've trusted ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, it still matters what we do. We still need to follow that example. What we do in this world is going to make a difference for us for all eternity because there are also these, re these levels of reward in heaven. Jesus tells us about places of honor that were not His to give, but for those whom the Father has chosen. And, and we need to understand that even though the Lord has chosen to give certain individuals places of honor, He's also ordained the reasons why they would be given those places of honor those gifts, those desires, those circumstances, that they would be uh, basically His witnesses, would glorify Him in, that would get them there. Paul talks about uh, more generically the rewards that we can expect to receive for the things that we do for Jesus in, in following His commandments, in, in being servants, in humbling ourselves, uh, the things that survive the fire that we build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ that we will be rewarded for in the day of judgment. We need to be reminded that um, there is something at the end of the road for us. Again, the, the warning about not following the Lord is our greater levels of punishment, but the promise of greater levels of reward are what are meant to get us to go down the path of obedience. Once we come to Jesus, the work has really just begun. You know, we, we don't receive great reward just because we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. It, we do receive the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we receive the new heavens and the new, the new earth. That's all based upon the work of Jesus Christ, and those things are secure to us. But our personal position, as it were, our state of blessedness in that kingdom has to do with what we do between the time we're saved and the time that the Lord takes us to be with Him. Once we come to Jesus, the work just begins. And so now we are to devote our lives to the extension of His kingdom. And as we get the word out, and as we try to reach as many people as we possibly can, as the Lord uses us to gather His people together, the Lord does not have us serve Him for nothing. God will be a debtor to no man. Whatever we sow, we will also reap in due time because God is gracious. He will reward us for the things that we do for Him. So this morning, I want us to be encouraged by the Lord, first of all, to be warned to avoid the people and the things. I mean, not just people, but the things that tempt us away from the path of the Lord, the things that would cause us to compromise, uh, the things that would, you know, not only just in the areas of pride but in, and in the areas of hypocrisy, but any sin. Remember again what Susanna Wesley said to her children, anything that takes away your desire for spiritual things to you is sin and you need to avoid it. So let's avoid the things that will move us in the wrong direction and will set us back and instead let's focus on those things that will move us ahead, that will allow us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that will you know, let's, let's put them on. Let's make no room for our flesh. Let's fix our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. 
let's look at his example and let's study the law of God, make the law of God our delight and walk in it so that the things we do for the Lord's glory and even the things we do to provide for ourselves in life would be blessed by the Lord, would be prospered. It makes a difference what we do. It's not just a matter of simply trusting in the Lord. That is paramount to our salvation. But we also need to fight against, again, those evil desires. We need to fight against our flesh. We need to fight against the things that feed it. And we need to make sure that we feed, as it were, the, the Spirit of Christ within us. We need to use the means of grace. We need to obey the Lord and serve Him. That is what the Christian life is all about. That's what the psalmist was writing about in Psalm 1. That's how the Great Commission is going to be fulfilled and how more and more people are going to come to know Him and how more and more people are going to obey Him is by our living holy lives. So may the Lord encourage us to put on the Lord Jesus and again to avoid those things that will lead us to compromise. Let, let's spend, shall we, just a moment in prayer and let's ask the Lord to um, help us uh, to do these things.